We have talked a bit about enzymes in the last video, but now let's dive into a few more specifics that you need to know for the HL exam about enzymes. Enzymes can be found catalyzing reactions both inside of cells and outside of cells. If they are found within cells, like in the cytoplasm or in specific vesicles or organelles, we call them intracellular. And if they are found outside of cells, but still within the body in specific open spaces commonly referred to as lumen, we call them extracellular. Two examples that you need to know as a difference between intracellular enzymes and extracellular enzymes are enzymes found within the processes of glycolysis and digestion. Glycolysis is a process that happens in the cytoplasm and uses a few enzymes to produce pyruvate molecules that are used in cell respiration. In the process of digestion, food is taken in by the mouth and moved to the stomach and then to the intestines. Each of these places have an external location called the lumen where the food sits. And the adjacent cells release enzymes into the lumen that break down the food into smaller pieces that can be absorbed. For these reasons, we can say that the process of glycolysis uses intracellular enzymes and the process of digestion uses extracellular enzymes. We will cover both of these in more detail in other videos. Enzymes support chemical reactions by lowering activation energy, but as chemical reactions take place and energy is converted from one form to another, the process of this conversion is never 100% efficient. Within metabolic reactions, the energy contained within the products is always less than the total amount of energy that the reactant started with. So where did the energy go? It was converted into heat. When some of the energy is converted into heat, we say that it is lost. But not lost in the sense that it disappeared or doesn't exist, which would break the laws of physics, we just mean it is lost to us because it is in a form that we can no longer directly use within our cells. Our cells can't turn heat energy into chemical energy stored in ATP, so it is lost to us in that sense. But even though some of the energy is converted into heat, it does not mean that it is not useful in another way. Many organisms like mammals and birds depend on this heat generation from metabolic reactions to stay warm in their environments. So even though we can't turn it back into chemical energy, it can help sustain life for organisms in colder climates. Metabolism describes all of the chemical reactions taking place in the body, many of which are supported by enzymes. But when we take a look at these reactions and the use of enzymes, many of these enzymes are part of a larger reaction pathway. Because each individual enzyme can only support one specific chemical change, if there is a complicated multi-step chemical process that needs to happen, we need more than one enzyme to do the job. Each enzyme can contribute one small part and change to the overall process, which again we call the pathway. There are many examples of metabolic pathways in the body, and we can describe the way they work as either linear or cyclical. For a linear pathway, the basic idea is that a substrate is being chemically changed in small increments by separate enzymes in a specific order until the final product of the pathway is created. The process can be run again, but a new substrate needs to be added as input to get it going. We can see an example of this again with the process of glycolysis. Glycolysis is a multi-step metabolic pathway that splits a sugar molecule, creating two pyruvate molecules. In order to achieve this, there are many steps and enzymes involved that modify the sugar molecule both before and after the split. And you can see the actual separation happens in the middle of the process. The modified products are created at the end and the linear pathway is complete, starting again with a new and different sugar molecule. For a cyclical pathway, as I am sure you can guess, the process is different because the beginning reactants of the pathway also end up being the products in the end. And along each step of the way, the new product becomes the substrate for the next enzymes. For this reason, these cyclical pathways like the Krebs cycle and the Calvin cycle can continue to happen as long as the proper materials are set in place. They are designed to perpetually work in a cycle over and over. We will discuss the details of these reactions over the next two sections in C1.2 and C1.3. But don't let these diagrams scare you because they look complicated. It's all just a series of small chemical changes supported by enzymes. It should hopefully be more fascinating than daunting to look at, but I will leave that judgment up to you. Enzymes can do their job of catalyzing reactions when the proper substrate binds to them. But in some cases, the function of enzymes can be inhibited in different ways. 
meaning that the enzyme will not be able to function for a period of time. Inhibitors are specific molecules that can prevent enzymes from working, and they come in two different versions. This first version is called a competitive inhibitor, which is when a molecule, the inhibitor, binds to the active site on the enzyme, physically blocking it from binding with the substrate it can catalyze. Molecules called statins are examples of competitive enzyme inhibitors. They block the active site of specific enzymes that work to form cholesterol. So, being an inhibitor, they reduce the amount of cholesterol made in the body by blocking this enzyme. Statins can be prescribed to people who have trouble with high LDL cholesterol. Competitive inhibition can be used to control the rate of enzyme reactions, because both the regular substrate and the competitive inhibitor need to bind to the active site to function. They are in direct competition with one another. The probability that each molecule will bump into the enzyme is the same, so it comes down to the amount of molecules present to control enzyme reaction rate. If there is a high concentration of substrate and a low concentration of inhibitors, the odds are that the enzyme reaction rate will be high. But if there is a low concentration of substrate and a high concentration of inhibitors, the inhibitors have a greater chance of bonding to the active site which will reduce the overall rate of reaction. As we discussed on the last slide, competitive inhibitors bind directly to the active site of an enzyme which blocks a substrate from binding to it. There is also another type of inhibition, called non-competitive inhibition, that can alter the shape of an enzyme and also inhibit it from working properly. Enzymes have multiple bonding sites, with the obvious most important one being the active site. But aside from that, there is another bonding location called an allosteric site. Just like the enzyme substrate specificity of the active site, only specific molecules can bind to the allosteric site. And when they do, they change the conformation of the protein which alters the shape of the active site. In some cases, it will change the shape of the active site so it will no longer work, which is the inhibition part. And in other cases, it can change the shape of an active site so that it does work. In either situation, those allosteric bonding sites are considered to be non-competitive because they are separate from the actual active site, meaning they are not in competition with the substrates when it comes to being able to bond. This makes them a better candidate for specifically controlling enzyme reaction rates. The human body is all about balance and maintaining homeostasis. If we look at the use of enzymes, it is important that they are balanced as well. We don't want enzymes working too much, but also not too little depending on what a particular cell needs at that time. In order to regulate the use of such enzymes, certain pathways contain a self-regulating process called feedback inhibition. This works via non-competitive inhibition that we discussed earlier, but has a unique twist to it. We talked about the active site and the allosteric site on the enzymes earlier, one that catalyzes a reaction and one that can alter the function of the enzyme turning it on and off. In the case of feedback inhibition, the product of the catalyzed reaction that takes place via the active site becomes the substrate that can then bind to the allosteric site. So the enzyme is literally creating the molecule that can also stop it from functioning. We can see an example of this within an enzymatic pathway that produces an amino acid called isoleucine. Isoleucine can be created via a series of reactions supported by enzymes that convert the amino acid threonine into isoleucine. The very first enzyme that starts the process, called threonine deaminase, can be inhibited by isoleucine if it attaches to its allosteric site, which then stops the entire pathway from functioning. The idea here is that if the body has a lot of the amino acid isoleucine and it is not being used up for other cellular functions, it does not need to make more of it so it has a high probability of bumping into and attaching to the allosteric sites of these enzymes prohibiting the creation of more. And on the reverse side, if all of the isoleucine is being used up, there is a low chance any of them will bond to the allosteric site of these enzymes, meaning the pathway will work to create more isoleucine. It is a self-regulating balancing act created through feedback inhibition. Up to this point, we have talked about a few examples of enzyme inhibition through both competitive and non-competitive means. In the examples that we have discussed so far, those types of inhibition are reversible. This means that the inhibitor will bind to the enzyme, but only for a certain amount of time. When it eventually detaches, the enzyme can then do its job and catalyze the reaction it was designed for. But in some cases, enzyme inhibition is not reversible. We call this process mechanism-based inhibition. This occurs when an inhibitor bonds to an enzyme, usually forming a covalent bond, 
creating a stable complex that will never detach. This renders the enzyme completely useless and not able to catalyze any other reactions after this type of bonding occurs. These types of inhibitors we classify as being extremely toxic, which includes substances like lead, mercury, and other heavy metals. If these components get into your system, they have the ability to bind with important enzymes and render them useless, which can be very dangerous for the body. And these types of molecules or substances do not have to necessarily bond to the active site of the enzyme. They can bond in other places on the enzyme that end up changing its three-dimensional structure, which alters the active site. An example of a mechanism-based inhibitor is penicillin. Penicillin is a chemical created by fungus, genus Penicillium, which is designed to kill gram-negative bacteria. Along with many other examples seen in nature, humans have unfortunately created toxic substances like this on purpose, and for the same purpose. Throughout our human history, people have created chemical weapons that are designed to be mechanism-based inhibitors that work against other humans. A negative side about knowing the intricate details of biochemistry.